people tired of all this women. <coughs> <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the Warren Astronomical Society, I present to you our featured speaker this evening, Jake Stolman. He is a professional 11th grader at Groves High School. For the 10 minutes a week that he isn't studying, practicing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and volunteering at the Cranbrook Observatory, he likes to play with his little sister and read Carl Sagan. This summer, he went to astronomy camp in Arizona, where he operated the 61-inch Kuiper telescope and slept in the lobby of the large binocular telescope. He owns far too many space-related clothing items for his own good. Jake Stolman. Well, I'll apologize in advance. But um, in any case, I'm Jake. Uh, as the resident millennial slash Gen Z here. So where are there some other millennials? I'm the resident Gen Z. Yes, I'm on my phone way too much. Yes, my earbuds are in half the time. And no, I don't play Fortnite all day. But let's talk about interstellar travel. So thousands of years before Magellan or Columbus, Polynesian voyagers <coughs> began a great journey into the ocean. They set out from New Guinea, skirting the Solomon Islands, which you can see here, in Melanesia, and then venturing further and further out into the open ocean. And so, as the islands grew farther apart, the Polynesians had to develop tougher and tougher methods of moving between islands and islands, all the islands. Uh, they developed really tough canoes called wakas, which had two holes. They developed better storage methods, and they developed better navigational methods. For example, they knew that they were near an island when there was, say, a specific type of cloud pattern, or there were birds <coughs> nearby, because birds don't usually live out in the open ocean, or there were flora, flowers, drifting in the water. But the way they navigated the big journey between islands, like right there, was with the stars. They used specific groups of stars passed down with a mental map to do something called wayfinding, which was <coughs> finding your heading and direction, much like contemporary celestial navigation is done today. And so using this, they made sometimes <coughs> thousands, thousands of kilometers, even miles sometimes, journey travel between the islands. And the epic of the Polynesians is one of heroism and bravery, but there's also some barbarity, which is kind of gross. I'm talking predator-level stuff. It's disgusting. But uh, in any case, the, um, the Polynesians are one extent of human exploration as a whole. We started as proto-humans scrounging around for scraps and whatever may appear, and if you know what movie that's from, that may include some kind of eerie monolith. <laughs> then, there are, then there were the great seagoing voyages of exploration with Columbus, Magellan, and the, uh, boy, and the Polynesians. Then were the uh, Apollo astronauts in the early 50s to 60s exploration of space, we, which was, I think, the greatest step in our exploration so far as compared to the others. Because here, we transcended into the realm of myth and legend. And this is also myth and legend, and this is also myth and legend. But I'd say the border is right there into where we became mythic as compared to our ancestors. And so anyway, in the decades following the uh, moon landing and the space race, we had a kind of outer planetary renaissance, and even interplanetary renaissance with Viking and Voyager, <coughs> all those famous probes that explored the planets. And so with that, the, the preliminary reconnaissance of the planets was completed. So we're about here. We now have to send men to Mars and beyond. But what lies beyond that? And because this is a, this is a talk on interstellar travel, it's interstellar travel. <laughs> <laughs> and so there are a lot of different methods we can use to go interstellar. And these are the ones we're going to cover today. And I've grouped them into three sections, which are bridging the interplanetary and interstellar speed gap. These things go, these things could be very fast when traveling in a solar system, but rather slow when compared to the rest of them. The next one is relativistic travel, which is getting close to the speed of light. And the last one is faster than light, which is going to break the laws of the universe and hopefully not make Einstein too mad. But first, I want to talk about light. If you don't know, light is really, 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 really fast. As in, it took the Apollo astronauts three or four days to get to the moon here, where the time it takes light to get from the Earth to the moon is light, moon. 
That's how fast it takes, 1.3 seconds. So how are we going to get from this, from a comparatively sluggish three to four days to seconds? It's going to be a pretty hard task. But some weird things happen when you get to the speed of light. For example, as you get closer to the speed of light, time slows down for you as compared to everybody else. Because Einstein, smart boy Albert Einstein, figured out in the early 1900s and 1910s that relativity is thing. Oh, we got someone coming. Is it locked? Is that unlock it? I can unlock it. Good lecture outside. It's better in here. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. <coughs> so, so this is, this can be kind of hard to illustrate because just saying time. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, time <laughs> get, goes a little slower as you get faster. So we're going to use a good example. Now, let's say the speed of light is 60 miles an hour. Can you think of anyone who can run 60 miles an hour? Because I can, <coughs> and his name is Steve Austin, oh, six million dollar man. It. <laughs> <laughs> so. Let's say I tell him to run, not 60 miles an hour, but only 55. Uh, run to the next town over. So we both synchronize our watches to noon. He runs and is back in 65 minutes. He runs to the next town and he runs back. That takes him that long, 65 minutes. And so when he gets back on my clock, I've been standing still and eating lunch. It's only, it's 1.05, but for him, it's 12.33. He sees himself running twice as fast, which means it only takes him half as long. And therefore, he takes only half as long to get there and back. Because when you get to 80% the speed of light or 95% the speed of light, you get to about um, double or half the time passes for you than everybody else. Now, I tell him to run 60 miles an hour. We both synchronize our watches for noon again the next day. He runs, comes back, and it's 1 o'clock for me but it's still noon for him. No time at all has passed for him. He effectively just ran to the, another town and back in an instant. And so, of course, when he's running, his brain literally wouldn't have the electrical signals. The electrical signals wouldn't move through his brain, wouldn't move through his neurons to get to, the, uh, to tell him that he's running. So he'd go careening off into a wall or something and explode into a million bits. But it's okay. We can rebuild him. We have the technology. <laughs> There's also the problem with dragging the atmosphere. Right? Yeah, that's it. Oh my god. So, another weird thing happens as you get closer to the speed of light. The mass of your object, the mass, the amount of force you need to push the object gets larger and larger. And so, it's not a linear relationship, it's an asymptotic relationship, which means that as you get closer to the speed of light, your thing becomes harder and harder to move, but you go faster and faster, and less and less time passes for you. So you can, you can get as close to light as you want. You can go 90% the speed of light, 99% the speed of light, 99.99999999% the speed of light, but you can't go 100, so far as Einstein says. And this means that a spaceship going at 99.99999999% the speed of light is way, way, way faster. Time flows, time flows way slower for it than a ship just going 99% the speed of light. And so, when we're talking about going this fast, we have to wonder, what does it look like? What does going that fast look like to an observer on the spaceship? <coughs> what if I told you I, you could see the back of your head? Because it's not this, it's this. It's kind of weird, but it's still pretty interesting and arguably a lot cooler than just stars flashing past you. So it'll work like this. The stars in front of you will be blue shifted. That's because light, as you're moving at very fast speeds towards something that's emitting light, or it's moving towards you, the light waves get squished together. And the light waves actually start co kind of compacting in your forward range. And then there's a ring of normalcy around there, where the, that's, that should be right, right parallel to you. And they, they won't experience as much dilation. But at the back, are the, rear, are the rear stars that should be right behind you, but you see kind of in a ring. And what that means is that they get red-shifted, which, as, a, as Hubble calculated, means that you're moving away from an object and that, and at such speeds that the light gets stretched out and turns red. 
And that's how Hubble actually found out that the universe is expanding. So that's what it would look like to go at light speed. There is a uh, movie called The Last Starfire that has a, a, a scene that shows that pretty darn well. It's one of the best examples I've seen. All right. Oh. I watched it a while ago. I thought we'd watch it. But, um, let's talk about something that we can't use. Rockets. Because rockets are very, 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 very heavy. That, this is the Saturn V, which took us to the moon. And so this is the entire rocket it needed just to go to the moon, whereas the actual spacecraft that was supposed to land and come back was about this. And that's just to go to the moon. That's not to go to Alpha Centauri or whatever. And besides, rockets are loud and big and explosive. We need something quieter, like a nuclear bomb. <laughs> yeah. I'm not kidding. This is the... Orion. Yes. Orion. <laughs> this is Project Orion, which is basically the most death metal way of going. To <laughs> I, it's literally shooting nuclear bombs out the back and riding the explosions to other stars. And so it's basically a putt putt after going bomb after bomb after bomb after bomb. You actually get up to some pretty uh, decent speeds. And this is probably the best way we could use our current stockpile of nuclear weapons. <laughs> so this is what it might look like. So at the back, there's a pusher plate, which is the shock absorber. This is going to be made out of something very sturdy that can withstand the heat of multiple nuclear blasts. Yeah. Then these are going to be, inside the pusher plate are shock absorbers, which will help reduce the shock of getting a nuclear bomb detonated right behind you. Uh, then further up are more shock absorbers, which shows how much force is going to be hitting that. Then further up is the upper middle section where the, the magazines are located and kind of shot through and there's various computer navigational systems back there. And then here are the, the most of the magazines. It doesn't show it here, but there are some magazines in here too. Most of them are in here and they're shot through a tube where they come out and hit the door. No, they come out and explode behind it and then Further up is the payload section where you'll put your spaceship or space hotel or whatever you want to put up there. And so let's talk about the bombs. The bombs, first of all, can't be just like this. They can't just be a circular spherical explosion that goes out in every direction because that's way too inefficient. So we're going to use something called a shaped charge, which is kind of a cone for the bomb where the bomb explodes in one cigar-shaped pillar of like exhaust, at, which will push our ship way more efficiently than this could. But there's a problem with the bombs, because the 1963 Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty uh, states that you can't detonate nuclear bombs in space, which is why JFK here is facepalming, because he signed it. And so, for now, Orion is illegal, which is why it's even more death metal, in my opinion. Can, so, you sorry, what? can you actually shape charge a, a nuclear detonation? It's a lot harder, but it's possible. It's not super duper efficient, not, at least not with current materials, but it's not just letting it explode spherically. Okay. I think if you get it early, that's the design for the bomb. If you get it early, then it could help explode. And so we're going to have a little running total of speeds here. Uh, for Orion, it can go 10% the speed of light. Not bad, but the slowest on our list. And so we're going to go with a quiet nuclear option now, which is Daedalus. Daedalus was a concept developed in the 1970s by the British Interplanetary Society. And Daedalus isn't as extreme as Orion is, but it's still a fascinating spacecraft. For example, the fusion drive, it requires fusion to work with little pellets that are injected into this giant dome here and they explode, and like Orion, they produce a blast that pushes the spacecraft forward, but instead of a nuclear bomb, it's this tiny little pellet that's about the size of a baseball, <clears throat> but it has about 400,000 of these in each of those tanks. And so, much like my, my school effort during the <coughs> trimester, the Orion mission will start off strong and then slowly decay. <laughs> uh, for example, it has two stages. It, the first stage will get us up to about 7.1% the speed of light after two years. Then it will, the first stage will detach, the second stage will burn for 12% the speed of light, or 
get us to 12% speed of light for one point at birth for 1.8 years, and it will have a 46-year close period towards the star, Barnard star, not Alpha Centauri, but the Daedalus program is flexible so that it can do, it can go to any star it wants really, <coughs> reasonably close. And this is what Daedalus will bring to whatever star it goes to. Uh, here it has a meteor shield because space, even though it's mostly empty, isn't completely empty, which I'll get to in a little more detail in just a second. Uh, where asteroids, your interstellar dust grains, won't hurt the sensitive probe bays of the spaceship. The probe bays will hold the, some interstellar probes that will kind of disperse out from Daedalus as it gets closer to the next star. And the, and the probes will survey this, the star system from multiple angles. And that, right below it are telescopes, which are 5 meter optical telescopes and 20 meter radio telescopes. Which is an interesting thing to bring these huge telescopes on an even bigger ship, because normally you just see spaceships with camera with small cameras. So it's kind of interesting to see something called an actual telescope on a spaceship. Then further past this is the computer hub, and then we get to my favorite part about Beatles. When I say that's the communication dish, I don't mean a little dot right there. I mean the engine bell is the communication dish, which is also pretty cool in my opinion. And so. Daedalus, uh, our current best estimates, can get us up to 12 times the speed of light. Next, we're going to talk about, we're going to have a kind of adagio for the booster ramjet. Yeah. Um, so, Carl Sagan here, is, Carl Sagan is here because in 1980, when Cosmos was first aired, they still believe that uh, the Boussard Ramjet could go 99.99% of the speed of light, however fast it wanted. But as we later found out, which is why it's not his fault, uh, it actually can't go that fast. So anyway, here's how the Boussard Ramjet would work. Interstellar hydrogen that it kind of picks up as it moves would be channeled into here because the cosmos over here isn't completely empty, as I just said. It's full of little hydrogen molecules. There's some other stuff, but mostly hydrogen. Where it'll be funneled into a proton-proton reaction chamber. And the proton-proton reaction is something really, really complicated and could be two 45-minute talks, but I don't want to do that anyway. Here's the engine <coughs> bell, where the exhaust is channeled out of, and the spaceship gets pushed along. But there's a problem drag, because interstellar space, again, isn't empty. There's a little stuff there. So the drag of the spaceship going to a certain speed makes it so the spaceship can't push on any further, even with its maximum thrust. We can illustrate this with our hand. So for example, if we try and high-five the air, it's relatively easy. But if we go in a car and stick our hand out the window and do it, it's a little harder because we're moving faster and there's more air pushing on. And somewhere in here is a point where, these, where our hand can't move any further, and we'll just get blown back. And way past that is the space shuttle, where probably if you open a window, you just get sucked out. Not a good time. <laughs> and so anyway, it can go 12% the speed of light, matching with Daedalus. So it's a sad story that such a, something that was thought to be such a great spaceship is only relegated to that slow of speed. But our next topic will be antimatter rockets. Antimatter rockets are actually decently feasible. We don't have good um, antimatter storage methods, but as an overview, antimatter is matter's evil twin. It's, some, it's produced sometimes in the heart of stars, and there are theories that in the very, very, very early universe, antimatter was just almost as plentiful as matter, but antimatter and matter annihilate. So in the early universe, it may have just been one part in a billion more matter than antimatter, but that one part in a billion makes up our, co our cosmos today. And so with these, with these little particles, even a gram, in even <clears throat> gram for each thing, we could get a bomb the size of Hiroshima and Nagasaki's bombs combined. So imagine what we could do with a full fuel tank of antimatter and normal matter. We could take ourselves to the stars, which it can take us to 50% the speed of light. 
this is speculative. I've heard very different values. I've heard not even a percent of the speed of light, and I've heard 99.99%. And so I use the most average estimates I've heard and chose 50%. Again, that is tentative. But now we're going to sail the stars. Uh, Kepler, the famous, uh, famous astronomer, once said that he wished to see people sail uh, with, with, with sails adapted to the breeze of heaven, right. if I remember correctly. And so the, these are photon sails, which are actually already in use. There has been solar sailing, for an example, there was a mission to Venus in the early 2000s, I believe, that used solar sails to propel itself along. <coughs> And so there's already an initiative called LightSail, which is headed by the Planetary Society, Planet, Planetary, Planetary Society yeah. um, that is starting to get LightSail ships in orbit. And there's also the Breakthrough Initiative, breakthrough initiative uh, by billionaires like Yuri Milner and also Stephen Hawking was a big part of it before he passed away. And so interstellar, for, for interstellar space sails work like this. Light from a star will hit the back of the sail and bounce off. But this, it's not a normal kind of wind situation. It's a situation involving sunlight bouncing off, making something called radiation pressure, which is different than normal wind just pushing off. And so this is good that we can use a star to propel ourselves away. But there's a bit of a problem. Because as you get farther away from the star, light falls off with the inverse square of the distance. So as you get farther and farther away, the acceleration gets less and less. So we can use lasers to push ourselves along. We can use giant arrays of laser beams, laser beams, to push ourselves along um, that focus the light way better than any star would and keep the light focused on our spacecraft all the way to the next star. And once we get to the next star, we could actually set up another array and have a kind of highway to the laser zone, ha <laughs> um, An interstellar highway, we could create the trade winds of the cosmos, winds by which sails could move from star to star. And this can unfortunately take us to 25% the speed of light, but... That's fast, really? Yeah. But um, <coughs> that, those are some of the values I've heard. Uh, it can actually, uh, it's actually way, way, way more feasible than the anti <coughs> matter drive is. And I suspect that we could be honestly seeing these by the end, by the end of the 2030s <coughs> going to other stars. But it all depends on, on the dreaded funding. And so now we're going to go really close to the speed of light. We're going to use black hole starships. This isn't what one would actually look like. This is from the 1979 Disney film, The Black Hole, which terrified me as a child. Yeah. 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 That's not good. Yeah, there was a scene where like an astronaut guy took off his helmet, and he's like a zombie, and apparently I ran screaming in my room. Uh, yeah. Anyway, black holes are very cool, but they are very hard to create. It would take the mass of the entire Earth, down, it would take enough pressure to take the mass of the entire Earth down to a tiny little pebble the size of an earring or so. And how would, we need to create a black hole to make our spaceship run. So how do we do this? We could use, we could do one of three things. A, you can get that pressure from just squeezing something down, which is really hard to do, uh, because as you get something more compact, it becomes more dense. And so that's going to be a very hard trial. The next way we could get that pressure is to use a Kugelblitz, which is a light black hole. It's German for light for ball lightning, where you fire massive arrays of lasers into one area and they create a black hole. And that is a lot easier to do than crushing something down. Can we not do that on Earth? I think this should be made illegal. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, it's not going to be world ending or anything, and I'll get to that in just a second. But You've got to wait around for a created black hole on Earth and then say, oops, as it eats up entire cities and continents. Well, it'll oh, actually... Just, just, just well, the understand. other thing is that miniature black hole is going to have the same gravity field as Earth. Yeah. 
So we won't do that on Earth. But I'll, I'll get to the mass that we need. We're not using Politicians them. are too stupid to understand it anyway, so go ahead. No one is making dangerous black holes up yes. there. I'm just supposed to that. But the third way to generate that source of mind-numbing, back-breaking, crushing pressure is to tell a high school student the SAT is tomorrow. <laughs> and so, anyway, the black hole that we'll need for our interstellar spaceship is only the mass of an aircraft carrier, so you won't have to worry. But the, the reason that we get along so fast is not because the black hole is pulling us forward, but because Hawking radiation is pushing us along. This was figured out in the 1970s by the physicist <coughs> Stephen Hawking, and kind of takes a theory that all of reality, all of space, even empty space, is filled with tiny particles that appear, run away from each other, and then snap back at each other and annihilate themselves. And they, they do all this at the speed of light. But as you may know, black holes, the event horizon of black holes, can suck in objects fat that are going f as fast or even faster than the speed of light. So these um, virtual particles that might form on the rim of a black hole are actually pulled apart and one escaped. And so slowly over time, the black hole generates more and more Hawking radiation. And the weird thing is, you'd think with the surface area of the black hole decreasing, it doesn't generate as much Hawking radiation, <coughs> but due to time and the warping of space-time around black holes, they actually generate more and more radiation as they shrink down, eventually ending with the power of many billions of nuclear bombs. So we're going to wait on that billions of nuclear bomb thing and just kind of let it be an aircraft carrier that's giving us enough power to push our little spaceship along. And it's very similar to Daedalus in that it has a giant bowl engine where the black hole's hawking radiation will push us along and the radiation will hit that bowl and propel us forward. And we can actually get the fuel from the black hole from the interstellar medium. Again, we will be using an interstellar hydrogen scoop, but we don't need a giant magnetic one 6,000 kilometers across. We only need maybe a few meters or so, just feeding it enough interstellar hydrogen to satiate its hunger and not have it explode and kill us all. Well, that that actually, that's a good idea. A long time ago when the pioneers went uh, from east coast to west coast, it was expected that they would live off the land. Well, if we want space travel, we have to live off space. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and the same thing is true for the Bussard Ramjet. And so, this can get us as close to the speed of light as we want, um, with some minor complications like drag, so maybe not the, this many decimal places. But our, we have gotten as close as we can to the speed of light, and so now we're going to break it. Four words encapsulate space exploration more than any other. Warp speed, Mr. Sulu. This was true for Mexican physicist Miguel Alcubierre, who was inspired by Star Trek to create his own warp drive, using it and named it after himself, calling it the Alcubierre Drive, which was eventually translated to this design called the IXS Enterprise. And Alcubierre dreamed of surfing the cosmos, surfing the waves of space-time. He would do this with something called exotic matter, which I'll touch on in just a moment. And... Hmm? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Anyway, he'll expand the reality, the space-time, the fabric of space-time behind him, and contract it in front of him, making it so that even though he doesn't go the speed of light, the space behind him is expanding, and the space in front of him is increasing. So instead of me learning how to run really fast at that door, it'd be like me tugging the entire wall over towards me. And obviously, tugging that entire wall is a lot of energy, which some people have calculated that this would, mean, this would use enough energy to fuel a star for some thousands of years. So this is far beyond our capabilities right now, but in the future, who knows? This can get us past the speed of light. It depends on how much energy you put into it. Like everyone told me about AP US history, it's what you get into it, what you get, it, what you get out of it is what you put into it. It's not true. Um, but our last, our last way of using space-time is wormholes. Wormholes are, I could do the famous example where I get a piece of paper and then I poke a pen through it and say, 
Oh my gosh. This is, no. this is uh, that's not like how I see <laughs> This is uh this is how a wormhole might work, where instead of moving across the paper, we can poke a hole right through it. But this also requires a tremendous amount of energy. And it also means that we need a lot of matter to hold the wormhole open because gravity wants to collapse the wormhole. It wants to pinch it off and create two black holes at each end. And so we, we need something to prop open the wormhole. We need something that exhibits negative mass. And that is negative matter or exotic matter. They go by the same name. And right now, we don't know if negative matter is possible. It, we, it sounds like something out of Star Trek, but then again, Star Trek dreamed of tri or not tricorders, uh, communicators that we now today call eye dorks. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, worst kid. <laughs> yeah, so, um, sure, did you hear that? In any case, we can maybe make make it so negative matter is possible to make on mass. For example, we've already started making tiny, tiny quantities of it by manipulating those virtual particles into, ma into making anti-gravity anti properties. And I think only time can tell whether we go, be go and make negative matter enough to power a starship like that. <coughs> but in any case, the wormhole can get us infinity to infinity and beyond, as Buzz Lightyear might say. But and no matter how we get to the stars, I think it's important to consider what we're going to do, how we're going to get there, and what we're going to do once we get there, and how we're going to interact with any life we might find. We can be... We'll do what we've always done, ravage the likes. Yeah, we could be interstellar despots like the Empire over here, or, or we could be scientific explorers like the Star Trek Federation over here. It, it, it's probably going to be a bit of both, but I don't. I think... I think I can imagine an interstellar diaspora of various spaceship types and propulsion methods moving out across the cosmos like islands, not unlike those in Polynesian voyagers of years ago. Now, of course, everything in this is speculative. For example, Leonardo da Vinci dreamt of flying machines that today look like they could never take off the ground. So these designs might look crazy compared to what actually takes to the cosmos. But there is one truth that we do know. Tomorrow's Friday. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. So, I went a little off the notes. I was originally going to stand down, but I can't back down. I was going to sit down there, but I can't back down from the challenge. So thank you, everybody. Right, Question? Go ahead. Why limit yourself? In what sense? Why not a dark matter drive or a dark energy drive? I don't. We don't know as much about dark matter or dark energy uh, right now as we may in the future. So there probably are some speculative designs for that, but I don't know if there's solid. Maybe not captured it, but dark energy supposedly makes this universe expand greater than the speed of light. So if we could capture that energy. Perhaps we couldn't. Or how about an Easter Bunny drive? Or a unicorn drive? <laughs> or a bunch of other things. Yeah, don't I know like those car drives. No, no, the, the universe is expanding. When people say the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light, it's because the it's because just two points on the universe is what they say are expanding faster. This, the fabric of space itself is not yet expanding faster than the speed of light. It'd be like me and a uh, six billion dollar man, Steve Austin. Each he would, he'd be running away. I'd be driving away at 60 miles an hour, and we wouldn't be breaking the speed of light, but our points apart from each other would, and that means that the universe is not actually um, expanding faster than the speed of light. But dark dark energy could be negative matter. I've heard some theories on that. Time will tell. I think you had a question in the back there. Uh, is travel in a straight line when you're going this fast, or is it curved? Uh, well, straightest line is the best way to get from point A to point B, but there can be differences. There can be course corrections um, if you're, if the star, because the stars actually might be moving along. Yeah. Uh, and, and if there's a solid object in front of you, do yes, you then crash, do you bug out of the shield? Yeah, there's actually a lot of designs for rotating 
windshields kind of that have abrasive ab ablative plates that once they get hit enough and once they're fractured enough they kind of detach and fly beyond the spaceship and then a new one rotates in and blocks whatever is coming into it. Yeah, um, what, way back at the beginning you had a, a spacecraft that was relatively slow and it had a whole bunch of probes Oh, Daedalus? And, and you're going to launch the probes toward the end of the mission. Actually, you want to launch the probes almost at the beginning because they'll be way out in front of you and also to the sides. Yeah. They'll be looking for objects that could destroy your spacecraft. That's true. So you want to detect those. Mm -hmm. So deploy them early. How fast will they accelerate? Um, the accelerations... Uh, I don't know. I don't quite know the accelerations. A lot of designs go at 9.81 meters per second square, which is Earth gravity, so that it'd be accelerating enough that you were standing uh, at the direction that the engine is shooting out, and you'd feel the pull of gravity as, it, as you would on Earth. And at that speed, it takes such a long time to get to there. Yeah. What do you think space yep. is made of? Uh, that's a big. One. That's a good question for. I don't know, I could give a whole talk you about that. You got stuff, you draw a yeah. circle around it and say, not this. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, space is probably a foam of virtual particles that spawn and annihilate each other, and also a fabric. But that's a very, it's a deep philosophical question where physics and philosophy can blend. Uh, this Daedalus project, you said that that was theorized by the European... British Interplanetary Society. What is, they need to stay in their lane. Interplanetary societies should not be making interstellar vehicles. <laughs> well, uh, I think they, they uh, because this was in the, uh, this was in the interstellar, interplanetary interstellar speed gap thing, they effectively could do interplanetary and interstellar. Yeah. A double difference. They're trying to get more yeah. of uh, We actually, this was a few years ago. Some of us remember a, a fellow from, a, I think it was Michigan State Community. He brought in a, basically what they call a CubeSat, and he had the rocket engine for that. And they're, they use a, I think it was an ion engine. And the difference between a regular rocket, it launches, makes all the noise, takes off, then it runs out of fuel. So then you reach your, pretty much your maximum speed, unless you can do the slingshot effect around planets and everything. Well, this particular engine didn't have enough power to actually move a um, paper clip on a table here, but the idea is once you launch it, it keeps on putting its energy out for a long time, constantly, so it keeps adding and adding and adding and adding. So even though it doesn't have much power to start with, since it continues without this energy, it gets much, much higher speed. They've actually got uh, we've, one of our satellites. One of, one, more satellite, that one of our satellites, that's the way it runs right now. Yeah, I, th I think you're thinking of Dawn, it could be wrong. Um, that you, I think that uses ion propulsion. And ion propulsion is good uh, because it can accelerate us at a slow speed, but for a while. So that might be good for interstellar travel. It was on the list of things that might make it, but I didn't see any ion spaceships going very fast. Uh, so yeah, I think that the ions can come out at roughly a factor of ten faster than typical rocket exhaust, mm -hmm. that that's not enough to get you in the 0.1 C no. regime, yeah. not even close. Yeah. So it, it seems to me that the thing that drives you to look at all these high velocities on these uh, these kinds of aircraft are really the human lifespan. That's the constraint, yeah. right? Okay. Yes. So it seems to me the easiest way to solve the problem is not to try to make something go at the speed of light, because there's a whole bunch of problems with that. It's actually just to make the human live longer. Yeah, well, there's also, so efficient, there's also an efficiency problem where uh, you don't want your interstellar package delivered uh, a decade too late. So that is, there, there are some examples in fiction where people upload themselves to the spaceship, digital consciousness and all that. But it's also just for speed's sake. Uh, not just human lifespan. So that, that first aircraft, back a couple of screens. Uh, Orion? This one? Uh, no, it was, well, you had the timeline at 0 0.1. Oh, the, uh, the run, the <coughs> thing? At the, at the end? Just back to. Back to. 
that one right there. Yeah. So are we are we gonna? I mean, are we in the stage of building something like that at all? Um, I mean, there is so illegal. Illegal. Is the Count, yeah, 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 that one's illegal. But there were countless designs for it so far. Okay. Uh, but this, but we haven't really begun any <coughs> real ones besides light sail, which <coughs> is the one that I featured. The gift, oh, that gift that I featured is actually a real spacecraft <coughs> that's in orbit, but it's not going to stars anytime soon. We still need no? to construct the array. Okay, so we're gonna skip right to this. This is where we're going to skip to. Yeah. In our next intercolor. It's probable. Okay. But the, okay. the comments, um, there was a recent proposal to make a bunch of small light sails and put instruments on them and get them up into orbit and then use lasers to propel them to a nearby star. I don't know what the latest status of that is, but. I mean, so you have to ask the question, what if it worked? A problem, well, there's a couple of problems with that. Uh, but I think a major one is, let's suppose you could get it up uh, to uh, a tenth of the speed of light. That means when it arrives at the star system you're aiming it at, it's going to go whizzing by any planet a thousand times faster than New Horizons went by Pluto. You would have minutes to take data, or one minute to take data on the planet before it's gone. Would the laser last that long? Well, you know, you wouldn't use a laser the whole time. It would become too defocused after a while. Right. But you would use it to get it going fast and then just let it coast. But okay. there aren't any lasers on the other end to slow it down. Correct. So it's going to go by at maybe a tenth of the speed of light, which is on the order of a thousand times faster than the horizons went past Pluto. And we only collected data for about a day uh, on that mission because it was going by Pluto so fast. We now speed that up by a factor of, of a thousand. There are other problems like how would you get the information back we're talking about real tiny spacecraft, right? Uh, the only way I can think that might, I mean, so, so anything on those is, has to be small and super light. So, um, I mean, SETI, the SETI website would indicate that you couldn't even get a message back using radio waves from one light year in distance. Uh, you might stand a chance with a laser beam back data, but uh, the power would be very small on it. You just couldn't package anything significant in size. Yeah. Well, I'm not qualified to answer the communications thing, but do keep in mind as you get to the other star, you can use, for at least light sail, to, you can use that to slow yourself <coughs> down. Use the light from the star to slow yourself down, so you get slower and slower speeds. And also, How with, would you slow down? Uh, the, the light from the star coming from the other yeah. side. Yeah, well, slow. it wouldn't be that far, and it would be still incredibly fast, but... Um, I don't think you could slow yourself down significantly. No, just, just like you, you can't speed up significantly. significantly. Couldn't you just retract the sail? Uh, is there a bunch of yeah, drop sail like on a sailboat. Uh, well, yeah, even no, if you no, drop yeah, the yeah, sail, yeah. the, the um, your yeah, spacecraft is still moving. It's not enough for that to matter. Right, and yeah. just as <coughs> the sunlight <coughs> from our star can't accelerate you yeah. to a very high speed, the sunlight from a star you're approaching cannot decelerate you very much. Yeah. Yeah. As it burns up, it's Operation Firefly, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and also, with spaceships like this, it's a little, I'm going to sound a little blunt, but you can just turn the spaceship around and then fire the engine in the other uh, way. Well, that's I mean, a, that's you slow something down, but you can't do it with the light sail. <coughs> what was that? I said you can't do it with the light sail, but you can do it with this. Yeah, yeah. Well, not with the light sail, because that power comes from somewhere else, but with something like an antimatter drive, or perhaps like, but not really a booster ramjet either. Uh, you have some trouble with that. But, uh, 
like Daedalus could reorient itself and burn to slow itself down. So I believe you had a question. Right? Uh, yeah, how did a young person like you find out about Steve Austin? My parents uh, my parents are the source of that. Uh, whenever because we live in a society where everything is being rebooted. Uh, like for example, Mark Wahlberg is making the six billion dollar man now. Uh, and so for like Transformers, I loved Transformers as a kid. The Bay movies were fine, but I watched the eighties cartoons. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Spider Man, uh, all sorts of that stuff. Missed out on Johnny Quest though. Sorry. So if we can stop talking about Johnny Quest for a minute. Uh, I'm Johnny Quest. Um, so, we were talking about one of the goals of Faster Than Life Travel to hopefully keep, you know, reduce the number of generations of humans that have to live in a spaceship. Um, what speed does it become impossible for humans to survive at, though? Uh, like, we don't really we don't know, that. know think, but... <coughs> I think the speed the isn't the problem, it's the acceleration. Yeah, it's the acceleration. It's Correct. So, if you start accelerating at 200 meters per second, you're going to have a nice, weirdly tasteful human suit on the Well, but, uh, I mean, but, but I thought, you know, I, I thought that with as you approach the speed of light, uh, you know, matter, I, I, I believe that, you know, your experience in space changes, right? No. No? Mm. Well, it's all relative. Yeah. yeah. You, you would have no awareness. That things would seem absolutely normal to you <coughs> as you approach the speed of light. Unless you look out the window. Unless you look out the window. But at the speed of light, you know, you electrical can't, you signals can't, uh, can't go in your brain. Of course, you're not experiencing time either. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that's that's, 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 that's someone that's, else measuring your neurons from the outside. Yeah. To the inside, yeah. your neurons are fine. Yeah. 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 That, and that's at the speed of light, which Rob, Rob, the doctor you can't use. Rob, <laughs> Rob, as he pointed out in one of his diagrams, um, as you approach the speed of light, your mass goes up and up and up, and so any additional acceleration becomes more and more difficult. Yeah. You're pushing the core is much more energy. Yeah. And so in the limit, you can't, you can't have infinite You can mass. never get to the speed of light. Because you can't have infinite mass. Yeah. yeah. And so, so <laughs> below the speed of light, I mean, there are, there are practical problems with getting near this. I mean, it takes big equipment to get an elementary, a proton, near the speed of light, right? Yeah. Let alone anything with any, yeah. you know, huge mass. starting with any rest mass of any significance. <coughs> but the other thing is, if you're going that fast and you run into anything, <laughs> you're toast. And, and when you're going that fast, there isn't any way to send something out faster than you and send stuff back. You can't see what's ahead of you. Right, and even if you knew there was something there, you can't, break. You, you can't break and you can't even steer. You're going so fast that your mass is so big that changing direction takes a huge energy input. So how can you how can you even stop if you're going past when if you're going near the speed of light? The same way you got there, hopefully. I mean, it depends on how you got yeah. there. Okay. If it's you, know, so you need to have you have to you need to have engines on both ends. <laughs> or as he said, if you can have lasers on the other end, you're slowing you down. Yeah. Right? There's a book called Tau Zero, which I haven't read. I, and I forgot who it's by. I'm, it just came out on Kindle. But it basically tells the story of a Bussard ramjet, and this is pre knowing that there's so much drag. It, the story of the crew is that they're accelerating more and more and more and more and more and eventually get to like the end of the universe they've been accelerating for so long because they've been getting higher and higher on this and time has been moving slower and slower <coughs> and eventually like trillions of years are passing for them in just a few moments. So, uh, If I can make a comment about the Bussard Ramjet, mm -hmm. it frequently is assumed, you know, somebody asks, well, what how fast could the thing accelerate? And I think our speaker or somebody said, 
well, you'd probably design it for 1G of acceleration, so you felt comfortable. You cannot get 1G of acceleration. The density of interstellar hydrogen mm -hmm. is way, way too low for that. Yeah. Your acceleration would be much smaller. Okay. And by the way, I once saw an application for a patent sent to the U.S. Patent Office to make such a thing, and that patent, which was, let's say, rather simplistic <coughs> in its understanding of physics, uh, mentioned that they would limit their acceleration to 1G, okay? <laughs> it wouldn't be hard to limit your acceleration to 1G, let's just put it that way. So just come to my basement and we'll, we'll start working on it. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, the nearest uh, exoplanet is uh, orbiting Proxima Centauri, yeah. and if you could go it, it's a, it's about uh, less than four light years away. If you could go four percent the speed of light, it would take you a hundred years to get there. But since you were going four percent of the speed of light, you'd only age 80, 89 years. Yeah. Uh, so you better send a couple of generations out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. that's four yeah. percent is right there. Yeah. About there. You don't get much of an age yeah. um, change at four percent. So that's way faster than we can go you right gotta now. You got to start getting into like the high nine. The I mean, look, if you if if one thinks at all about going to the stars with any, even with ion thrusters, it's going to take many thousands of years yep. and well, many generations of people. Yeah. You will have wars on board. Huh? No. Yeah. We'll negotiate. Yeah. Have you ever done a timeline? I'll do the dishes. The and we're we're talking the, about time scales laundry. <laughs> much larger than, than all human recorded history. And, and you're telling me there won't be wars? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Right. I mean, just looking at the basic age of exploration by sail gives you an idea of what human psychology does on a three-year or five-year voyage. I mean, you can't. Can, you, can you can have, have the most cars. dedicated crew <laughs> in the world. Why there yet? Just <laughs> about any any parent will tell you their kids don't turn out like them. <laughs> right? You can't make it, the next generation have the same goals and values right. and stuff. Well, I read an article someplace, I don't know where it was, but the very wealthy in this country want to send up private rockets to uh, asteroids that have a lot of gold or silver mm -hmm. in it. Yeah. They're, they're oh, yeah. interested in the and getting wealth. Yeah. Well, there's not a whole lot of asteroids of gold to silver. There are with platinum. Yeah. Well, that will probably happen. That will depress the prices, though. On Star Trek, we about things like warp fields and warp bubbles and stuff. What are they talking about? How would that work? Um, well, the president would invest in it. Yeah, the design of the. The design of the of the Akubi air drive is actually kind of creating a work bubble in effect. Yeah. It's um, making a, it's creating a bubble of safety around it, but space expands behind it and space contracts in front of the yeah. bubble. But there's a bubble around the spaceship that keeps it safe and in a normal normal plane of reference. Uh, I'd like to comment that while yeah. some of these ideas that our speaker has presented are shall we say, rather futuristic, mm -hmm. right? Admittedly, I'm sure. Yes, definitely. Uh, there was a speaker at the Ford Club, something like maybe a couple of years ago, uh, who works for NASA. He's a physicist. And he gave a similar <coughs> presentation to the Ford Club. He happened to be in town visiting a relative who went to the Ford Club, so they snagged him to give a talk. And he said, you know, he is right in the middle of uh, a program at NASA to explore any ideas for how to create revolutionary new methods of powering spacecraft faster and so forth. 
and the, you know they're open to that. They don't have a lot of people working on it because <coughs> there isn't that much to work on, you know. I mean, That's but, a lot but to they, work they on are right evaluating every idea, including these. And so far, nothing looks promising in terms of totally new concepts beyond ion drives. Yeah, well, but I mean, they, it's not like they aren't thinking about it, right? Nobody's yeah. just dismissing it out of hand. They're, they're serious. They have very good physicists working on this stuff. And so far, they don't see a way to make it action. You know, it's fine to think about it, to write science fiction stories about it, which most of us enjoy, including me. Uh, but if you're actually going to try to build something, you have to get real. And barring some breakthrough in physics, based on known physics, which is all we have at the moment, uh, beyond the ion drives, um, that doesn't seem to be, and in terms of anything anybody's willing to do, nobody's willing to put nuclear fission bombs up into space. <coughs> Uh, it is it is illegal. Yes. Uh, there, there's an international treaty that says you can't do it. Oh. But if you did it sufficiently, like you used normal propellants to get you out to like a, a Mars distance, would it then be safe, or is that radiation still? Not the point. That's not great. It's, it's ruled out by international agreement in principle. Well, yeah, but right. That, that, that's just a law. I mean, that's, that's not a... <laughs> it's not a law of physics that says we can't... Are you saying that the U.S. might not actually adhere to a treaty in science? Never. I would never... You know, you know it, I know it, we all know it. Very bright over here. Uh, any last questions? Yeah. Uh, the one with the uh, antimatter fuel. Don't take any nat ordinary matter with you. Just take antimatter. Yeah. And then get your matter fuel from the interstellar medium. Now, how much does that get you? Maybe there's not enough. Maybe your acceleration will be very moderate. So one best one problem with that would be the funnel yeah. you would use to collect it would be the first thing the normal matter hit. No. You're collecting yeah. normal matter. You're not connecting. Yeah, collecting I, I realize matter. that, but the your funnel would be anti matter, right? That's no, what you're saying. No, what I'm saying is your, your fuel tank only contains anti matter. The rest of it's. What's your fuel tank made out of that holds this anti matter? Oh, I don't know. I'm not a genius. <laughs> I'm not a genius. I'll invent something that holds anti matter. Well, if you have humans on board, they're going to be producing plenty of waste that's normal. Uh, I'd have to do the math on that. Um, just, just a couple. Just a couple. I, remember, I think I remember reading it's a few years. Uh, there's a great image online of accelerating at 9.81 meters per second that shows the time scales oh, yeah. where you can get to the end of the observable <coughs> universe in like 50 years or so. Jeez. Most of your friends will be at Let's one day, it. you would get close to, close to your top speed in a very reasonable time. Yeah. Most of your friends will be fine. Most yeah, of a very reasonable time by your clock. Yeah, right. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can go a little impromptu because I, I honestly forgot we were recording, so I went a little. Well, I personally can't remember the last time we had a lecture land so many jokes. Like, a lot of people make them, but they don't land well. Those <laughs> landed really well. Thank you. If that makes up for me stuttering a lot, then I guess it's okay because I did impromptu for the forensic and I won one medal the entire year. There you go. Well, yeah. 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 Thanks, everybody.